Okay, welcome back. So we were at listening, right? And we were talking about feedback. How do we, um, in listening, how do we improve uh, our communication is, is another way is to have a feedback. So when, what does feedback mean? Just kind of paraphrasing what you heard the other person say. Or you're saying, okay, these are some of the main things that I heard you saying. These are the main points that you wanted to convey to me. Um, have I been? Have I understood you well? Does that does that kind of a feedback actually help to filter around what you need to talk about? It does. All right. So giving a feedback sometimes is a very important is a is a good way of communication. It may look very formal. But that's something that is that can be put together as a practice. The third one, um, the the other aspect or the other part is expressing or speaking. Okay, to be able to speak. So just listening is not the only thing, but also responding is also coming back with a with some kind of a, uh, a response. Now there are. Definitely, there are many different ways that people can respond, right? Some people respond to the emotion. Um, you may be telling me about, uh, you know, I went to my friend's house and uh, such and such thing happened. Um, you know, I, was, uh, I, I saw that my friend was very uh, uh, stressed because of this reason, that reason, three reasons, you may tell me. Now, there are many ways I can respond back. So I can say, oh, your friend looks very, very stressed. And that kind of bothered you. That is an emotional response, yes? Or I may respond, oh, your friend looks uh, like he's got a lot of things in his plate. He probably needs some help. And uh, it looks like you are very concerned and want to do something about helping him. So it's a more rational, practical kind of a response that, that you're giving, right? So we may respond in different ways, but it's important to actually bring about a certain response. Sometimes when we respond, we can be very, very animated in our response. Like, like animated is like lots of drama and, you know, oh, someone said that. And you know, there's a lot of lot of expressions, but some will be very, very quiet. Even if you're telling them the most exciting thing, they will have a very, very calm face response. Now, these are all just very different, very different variations in the way that we actually do respond. Okay. But it's important to be as best as possible to be appropriate in the way that we, we do respond. So let's just look at. What are some principles that we need to do, uh, need to have when we respond? Let's look at a verse for that. Ephesians chapter 2, 4, verses 29 to 32. Can somebody read it? Ephesians 4, 29 to 32. Do not use harmful words, but only helpful words, the kind that build up and provide what is needed, so that what you say will do good to those who hear you. And do not make God's Holy Spirit sad. For the Spirit is God's mark of ownership on you, a guarantee that the day will come when God will set you free. Get rid of all bitterness, passion, and anger. No more shouting or insults. No more hateful feelings of any sort. Instead, be kind and tender hearted to one another and forgive one another as God has forgiven you through Christ. OK. So what are some of the things that we can learn from here when we are speaking back? What should we take care of? Don't tear them down, right? But to build them up. So whatever, whatever you're using, be, let it be something that encourages them. OK? Now think of something that you wanted to point out to someone. How would you do it? Like, let's, let's look. Can someone give me an example? How can we point out something that you want to tell your friend? 
ya Akil. Okay, okay, good, good example. So you're saying, let's say someone is talking to you very, very harshly, you know, very, uh, first of all, they're very loud. They probably use words that are uh, maybe not too hurtful, but then they, they don't come across very well. Okay, hey, what da? How you can talk like that da? Right? Something that is, that's not very gentle, right? Maybe that's how you'll talk probably. But when someone is hurt, how can you speak and how can you share something has hurt you? How would you do that? Without breaking them, but building them up. So Akil said one thing. He said something very nicely. He said, I know you want to communicate something to me. I know you want to tell me something. But there are some things that hurts. Maybe they've used certain words. And when you say that, that hurts me. Or uh, maybe when you're when when you're being too loud, it kind of makes me scared. So actually building them up and saying, you know, it, I would really, it would be really nice if you can, uh, if you can tell me, you know, in using some kinder words because I know you speak kindly. But at times I've heard you hear uh, use kinder words. Um, you know, be little, you can be a little patient with me, and and that really helps me because I know I've seen you do that. So anything that actually encourages them and builds them rather than breaks a person okay also use words that bring support and encouragement and affirmation use words that are good to hear words that are good to hear so keeping away any kind of language or name calling labeling that can break a person okay so no shouting no insults no language that is vulgar or obscene. All right, so that's how we can communicate uh, to to someone when when they are actually speaking to somebody. Okay, all right. Uh, I, I also want to bring up something that um, very often we may have something to say, but we don't say it because we're thinking, okay, they should understand. And this usually happens in marriage. You don't say anything because you think that they should understand. Is that fair? Is that fair? It isn't, right? You're assuming something. You're assuming something that you actually want to share, but you're not doing. So it's important to be, if you have an opinion or if you have something that you're feeling upset or something about, be open rather than suppressing that kind of a communication. So speaking out what is necessary. OK? All right. There is a whole lot of um, verses in the Bible that brings about uh, from Proverbs that actually give you very many uh, good insights about communication. OK? And there are many here. But we'll just take a couple of them to really understand it. The rest you could probably think about, um, go back and read, OK? So and, and we'll, we'll see how this can apply to marriage, all right? So let's look at the second one, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. Thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword, but wisely spoken words can heal, OK? So how can we apply this to marriage? Thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword. So what may be some thoughtless things we could tell others? Very often we use this, oh, you're such a fool. We say that very casually sometimes, no? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Uh, some personal remarks also, sister. Okay. Like, can you give me an example? Like attacking the like personally how they behave. Okay. Maybe like personally, like, some some trait in them. You're saying? Yeah. 
Okay. All right. Sometimes we can be very thoughtless about something that without really knowing what may be at the background. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. So that's one. Next one. A gentle answer. Uh, that's this is Proverbs 15 1. A gentle answer quiets anger, but a harsh one stirs it up. Uh, tit for tat responses. Okay. You said it this way. So. I want to, you know, say it. Yeah, correct. Good. All right. Um, Proverbs 17, 27. Those who are sure of themselves do not talk all the time. People who stay calm have real insight. How can you apply this to marriage? Huh? To, uh -huh. to avoid arguments, sister. To avoid okay. arguments. Okay. Use the mic. Uh, okay. Yeah. Just because two people are conversing, it doesn't mean if one person's voice is very loud and you know trying to do like a self-defense and keep on blabbering X, Y, Z, whatever the uh -huh. issue is, does not mean the other per that person is right. But the other person who stays calm will know that you know I'm not the one at the thing and I don't have to adhere to match up to that uh, person's uh, emotions and thing. Okay. God will give you that wisdom to just be still in some scenarios. Okay. And if required, you can say a word or two, but otherwise refrain. Okay, good. I, I would see this very much in the aspect of parenting. You know, as a parent, maybe some of us are parents here, there is this need when you want to correct your children, you keep saying and saying and saying and saying, saying one thing that you will bring it up in very... 10 variations and by then your child is ready to you know, explode. Once is good, right? So knowing when to stay calm, stay quiet, you've said something, keep quiet. There are earlier times when I've done that, my children in summer, you've told me that now, I think I've understood. You don't have to keep telling me that again and again. You know? So this has applied to me. All right, next one. Um, there is more hope for a stupid fool than for someone who speaks without thinking. Proverbs 29, 20. How do you apply this in marriage? Someone who speaks without thinking. How, can, how do we, in our communication, speak without thinking? I'll give you an example. You know, sometimes when there is conflict that happens, what do couples sometimes say? Huh? Your parent... To shut oh, up. You shut up, okay. <laughs> All right. Very, very commonly that I hear right now is, okay, if you don't want to stay with me, you go away. Right? Get lost. Don't say, go. Right? So what are those? Those are... Words that you speak without thinking, right? At the spur of the moment, impulsive moments, that's when it says, okay. So you can check, you can do the rest of it later. All right, how do we, how can we be careful about not breaking our communication? There are some things that can cause a breakage of communication. When communication is broken, what happens? It leads to Distance. It leads to withdrawal. Someone will draw, withdraw or somebody would isolate. And then you become, like I said, like the person who you are tra traveling in the train with. Physically present, but emotionally completely absent. Okay, so what are some common reasons why communication breaks down? The fear that... Sorry? Ego. Okay, ego. Um, all right, good. So what? How do we? how do we expand that? That ego is... Okay, why should I be the first one to say sorry? She should come and say sorry to me. Anyway, I'm above her. I'm the head of the family. Why should I say sorry? She should say sorry. Does that break communication? Yeah, okay. What else can break communication? Anger. Anger, okay. So... 
uh, when you're expressing your emotions way beyond what is necessary can break down. When someone's coming and telling you something and the first thing that you do is explode in anger, you have uh, you have stopped the other person from coming to discuss with you. Yes? Very good. Then? Huh? I'm correct. Okay, so self-righteousness maybe, right? Okay, that always thinking that you are right without being humble enough to listen to somebody else. Very good. Silent treatment? You know what silent treatment is? No? You have a fight with somebody and nobody talks. There would be silence for days and weeks and months. No one's talking. And then slowly something or the other happens and then it becomes back to square one. But there, no one has spoken about the problem. That's called silent treatment. Yeah? Does that happen? Does that happen? Remember what happened? <laughs> okay. All right. What else breaks communication? When someone is coming and sharing something with you, you tell them you can't feel like that. No? Someone is saying, I was very hurt with what you said. Chuma, you're just acting like a drama queen. Right? You're too. You're, you're, uh, you're watching too much of uh, soaps, dramas, right? So what happens? They don't, they don't want to share. Or if you choose to hide your feelings, you say, okay, I'm not going to share any of my feelings with this person. When you suppress your feelings, it, it again can break communication, right? If you don't have interest to talk, does it break communication? Yes. If you are not attentive, you are looking somewhere else when someone's talking to you, it breaks communication, right? Suppose you're judging or you're criticizing, right? Someone is very openly coming and saying this to you, and then you're judging them for. Um, and this is just not in marriage, right? Let's say a close friend comes in and tells you they have some addiction and say, you know, I'm really struggling with this. And then you say, you? You're struggling with this. Shame on you. you know, how can you do this? You're a Bible college student. and So you're judged, right? You've criticized them. And do, will they ever come back to you? Don't ever think so. Right? So these are some things that actually break down communication, not just in marriage, but in every, uh, every other way. Okay? Also, when something is held against you, like I said, You've told, you've told somebody something, but then it is used against you at some other point of time. So all of this breaks communication. And we've got to be careful to uh, be more considerate, more responsive, more, more vulnerable, willing to be open as we communicate. OK? Done? All right. Any questions before we go to the last part of the spiritual side of communication? Any questions from your end? In all aspects, would you base communication as the most important thing in marriage? It's one of the uh, biggest elements. The the like a like one of the biggest backbones of marriage of building a relationship. Yes, I would. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other question? Online students, any questions? Okay, everyone is top in communication. Very good. Nice. All right. Okay. So let's look at the spiritual side of communication. Okay. All right. So um, there's a spiritual. Just a minute. Just give, give me a minute.
Ich mal den Diplom. Thank you. All right. So um, the spiritual law of communication, I think it's important for us. We'll, we'll look at two, um, two important aspects of communication when it comes to uh, understanding it spiritually. OK? One is that the power of our words, that our words have a lot of power it bears a lot of things all right and uh, we look at three things the first one is that your words can bring either life or death blessing or cursing can someone read proverbs chapter 18 verses 20 to 21 proverbs 18 20 to 21 you will have to live with the consequences of everything you say. What you say can preserve life or destroy it. So you must accept the consequences of your words. Okay. So what does it what does it say that your words have consequences? It can do one of two things. It can either bring life or it can bring death yes are, are you all with me yeah so the bible teaches us that what we say can have a very uh, a huge impact on the person who's hearing it because what we say or how or what we bring about is what really creates where we are, or our future, or or whatever our, our our present is, okay. So it can affect not just what we're going through right now, but it can affect what can happen later. And um, so we so we got to be careful of how and what we say. And I'm sure each of us have experienced this at some point of time in our lives. The good example is think back to your childhood. Think back when you were sitting in class. Is there something that your teacher said to you that you remember? Huh? All good things, OK. All right, good. If your teacher has said good things to you, God bless her. Right? I've had teachers who I remember one teacher said very good things, even though, you know, I was naughty. She, she said good things, but in the experience that I've had of teachers, the what would they say? I was pretty bad at Hindi. Okay, so that's why I don't talk too well, right? So she used to say, "Aap kabhi bhi nahi sudroge." sudroge. She, she used to tell me that, you know, because my Hindi marks were so low, that kabhi bhi nahi sudroge, right? So she used, to, she used to say that. My maths was terrible. Okay, so I had a teacher who said, thank God you know what 2 plus 2 is. Right, so what, is that, what does that create? What does it create? Yeah, it, it, it made me hate Hindi all my life, all right? Or it made me have a repulsion to math. But so so that's what's important. And you know what I'm talking about? All of you are looking at me like you all have never had any experience like this. So many experiences, Asapu. Okay. Right? So wh what we say really, really matters. How we either we're building someone or we're encouraging them or we're actually uh, bringing about death. Okay, or we're blessing someone, or we are bringing about a curse. So what we really say matters, and especially so much more when it comes to our families. Okay, let's look at the second principle of the power of your words. Your words can either build or destroy. 
Romans 10, 17. Can someone read that? So then, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message comes through preaching Christ. OK, so what does faith do? Uh, I mean, what? how do we get faith? By hearing the word of God, right? So when we speak words that bring about faith, it always uplifts somebody. It always encourages them. It always helps them to move forward. Uh, especially when you know uh, one of your family members has come in and said about um, maybe your children come in and talk of how they did badly in school. What you say really matters. And yeah, I know this this came like that, but I'm sure you'll you'll do well, right? I'm sure it will be all right. You know, keep going. You're doing a good job. You know, keep at it. So that really builds faith, rather than you know, if you keep going on like this, always you'll be at the end. You'll be failure, right? So, so those are things that that can actually build the faith on on doing better or actually destroy it. Last one. Your words can release your faith or release your doubt. Matthew 17, 20. Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Okay, so this, what you say, will actually release your faith. So when you, this verse talks about if there is, Anything that comes in between that makes you uh, not believe, when you speak to it, you're releasing your faith. right? So in every situation that you are seeing, so maybe it is also a situation of, let's say, there's a whole lot of conflict in the marriage. You can release faith by saying that my marriage is a good thing. My marriage is something that is blessed by the Lord. My marriage will fulfill the promises of God. My family will, will come under the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you are speaking, you're releasing faith. You're actually allowing the word of God to really dispel into your situation so that you can see something come out beautifully. So we either release our faith or we release your doubt. Or you can say, oh, this, none of this is going to happen. Um, you know, I, I regret getting married. I regret finding this person for my spouse. Then we have released doubt, right? So coming to a place to release faith. So what is the power of your words? What do your words do? It can bring life or death. It can build faith or destroy it. It can release faith or release doubt, OK? All right, so how do we use our words correctly? And let's look at James chapter 3, verses 2 to 12. And I want you to uh, tell me what does, uh, we'll read it out loudly and see what uh, does James liken the tongue to. All right, so someone can read that out and then we will. All of us often make mistakes, but if a person never makes a mistake in what he says, he is perfect and is also able to control his whole being. We put a bit into the mouth of a horse to make it obey us, and we are able to make it go where we want. Or think of a ship, big as it is, and driven by such strong winds, it can be steered by a very small rudder, and it goes wherever the pilot wants it to go. So it is with the tongue, small as it is, it can boast about great things, just like how large a forest can be set on fire by a tiny flame. And the tongue is like a fire. It is a world of wrong, occupying its place in our bodies and spreading evil through our whole being. It sets on fire the entire course of our existence with the fire that comes to it from hell itself. We humans are able to tame and have tamed all other creatures wild animals and birds, reptiles and fish. But no one has ever been able to tame the tongue. It is evil and uncontrollable, full of deadly poison. 
we use it to give thanks to our lord and father and also to curse other people who are created in the likeness of god words of thanksgiving and cursing pour out from the same mouth my friends this should not happen no spring of water pours out sweet water and bitter water from the same opening a fig tree my friends cannot bear olives a grapevine cannot bear figs nor can a salty spring produce sweet water thank you okay so let's look at that passage and see what are the three um how is the tongue likened to there are three things that the tongue has likened has been likened to okay akil wait okay yeah the rest of you because akil always helps helps the rest of the class yeah okay come on what are the three things that are written three things that it's likened to tongue is like a fire why is it likened to like a fire Uh, sorry when when we speak words words what happens what does fire do it burns right yeah fire burns so when you when you when you speak uh, that words incorrectly it says it sets on fire the entire course of our existence with the fire that comes to it from hell itself so the fire can actually destroy everything so so deeply isn't it okay good what else mouth of a it is like a bit in the mouth of the horse what does that mean what do you put in the it's called a bit yeah you put something in the uh, mouth of the horse so that you can control it okay so it's saying we put it into a horse to control it but but what does it say but it's so difficult to no one can ever been able to tame the tongue so that's what it's likened to right what else the, the next there are two two things tongue can boast okay, what is it likened to what is the example i think somebody said it here ship yes so what does it say the ship as big as it is it can be steered by the small rudder you know what a rudder is rudder is that's there under the ship that helps it to move right and uh, that that's that's exactly how our tongue is it's so small but it can direct the course of your life and the last one what does it say it's talking about the fire yeah but it says about how a tiny play um, spark can actually create a big forest fire so that's how uh strong or that's how um what do you say how much of control the tongue has okay and we are and what what happens it also talks about how we do two things with our tongue we praise and we 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 also curse right we are ungrateful we praise or we can be ungrateful and it says my friends this should not happen so as people who are believers our words should create life we need to be careful of the way that we use our tongue and use it for praise we use it for thanksgiving for worship for encouragement for support for love for affirmation that's what we are called to do okay especially in marriage um the next principle when we are looking at uh, a spiritual law is how we can speak blessing over the things around us in this because we're talking about marriage we're looking at our spouse and our children but you can speak a blessing over everything that's around you you can speak a blessing about your neighbor right now right you can speak a blessing in the scooter or the car that you're going in speak a blessing over your work speak a blessing over your finances over your health over your marriage to be over your spiritual growth we are called to speak a blessing 
So when you look in to the Old Testament, the uh, um, God had told, had, had taught the priests, the Levite, Levite priests, to bless the people, right? To, to speak those words of blessing. You see that in uh, Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 to 27. Can someone read that? Uh, number 6, 22 to 27. The Lord command Moses to tell Haron and his son to us the following words in blessing the people of Israel. May the Lord bless you and take care of you. May the Lord, Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look on you with power and give you peace. And the Lord say, said, if they pronounce pronounce us name as blessing upon the people of Israel, I will bless them. Okay, so the Levite priests actually pronounced a blessing over the people. And look at the 27th verse. It's so beautiful. It says, if they pronounce my name as a blessing, I will bless them. So when you pronounce the name of Jesus as a blessing. So when you say, I bless you in the name of Jesus, what does it say? Who will bless? God will bless them. So imagine talking to your family and your children and saying, I bless you. I bless your health. I bless your future. I bless your, your marriage. I bless uh, your spiritual growth. I bless your heart. I bless everything in Jesus' name. And what does Jesus say? What does God say? He will bless. It's a promise that is given to us. So, so it's a very powerful thing to do, to bless. So you can do this even now. Okay. Every day think of one person, go to them and say, Diksha, I bless you in Jesus' name. Asapu, I bless you in Jesus' name. Right. So go to somebody else and speak the word of blessing. All right. Next one is uh, the spoken word. Uh, the spoken word. What can we do with the word of God? What have we been given authority to do? By the word of God. To speak to fight it. fight the spiritual battles. Yes. Whatever is coming against us, whatever the enemy br brings against us, what is it that you have as the sword? Which is the word of God. Ephesians chapter 6. Right? What does it say? The sword of the spirit is the word of God. So you think of how you have a sword and you are going to slay everything that the enemy brings before you. And how do you do that? By using the word of God. That is like a double-edged sword. That's what um, the Bible says, right? His word is active and like a double-edged sword. It's living, it's active like a double-edged sword that cuts through marrow, right? So that's what we are called to do so that we bring down every plan of the enemy. So especially when you see things in your home that the enemy is creating, maybe it's confusion, maybe it's sickness, it's pain, it's difficulty, uh, it's challenges. Speak the word of God over your situations as... as um, uh, as the Bible instructs us. Put on that armor and speak speak of it. And uh, we will see that's the way of how we need to resist the enemy. Okay? All right? So we've dealt with a lot of practical as well as biblical aspects of communication. Okay? All right. I'm open for questions now. You have a question? Okay. Yes. Yes, Komal. If someone is cursing you, then how to uh, reject that thing? If someone is cursing you, how do you reject it? Okay. Um, how can you reject it? So I think I, I think two things. If if you know if someone you know is cursing you, right? If you have, then I think it's important to. Uh, one, it's first and foremost is to reject it, right? 
because we are called to be blessing. We're not called to be a curse, right? And you have the authority over every word that is spoken because you're using the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, to nullify that or to, what do you say, to break it, to break the power of it, all right? So you can immediately bring an I reject, I rebuke all of that which is said over me, and I speak God's word, whatever it is that they've said you, said to you, say what the word of God says to you. Because I believe that this is what God has raised me up for. This is what is spoken of me. I have the mind of Christ. I, I have excellence. Whatever they've said about you, rebuke and begin to speak the word of God. That's Come again. And you can declare blessing. Yes. So that's the second part of it that you're going to declare a blessing over their life. Like someone saying, cursing to you, saying, hey, brother, you know, I'm declaring a blessing over you. May you be blessed in Jesus' name. They will, you know, coals of fire, when you put water, what will happen? All that will come off. No, that's what's going to happen. Okay? All right. Sister, can we tell them not to uh, repeat it or not to do such things? Yes, you can. You absolutely can. Yeah. Uh, you told that being silent is not a solution. When should we be silent in a relationship? Okay. So being silent in a relationship, especially, um, you know, when, when you are having a very heated argument with somebody or when two people are having very heated arguments with someone, that may be not a very good time to bring about a lot of discussion. So at that point of time, being calm, being silent can help to bring down the, uh, probably the, um, the, uh, the intensity of the situation, all right? So if you're seeing someone else, if you're seeing the person you're talking to in a very, very heated emotional space, if you are calm, if you are silent at that point of time, it doesn't worsen the situation. You can wait for a later point of time to come back and discuss it with them. All right. So that's probably a good time to be silent rather than create a whole lot of um, fire in the situation. So when someone else is heated, till you, when you are quiet, it can actually help the other person calm down. And then coming back later to discuss it is maybe one of the times that you can be silent in a relationship. OK. All right. Any other thoughts? Any other questions? Prem, all good? You have a question, Ramal? Yes. Ma'am, uh, sometimes we took decisions emotionally. How we can overcome emotions? Uh, is, are you relating that to communication? No. This is a general question you're asking me. So you're saying, oh, when you have said something emotionally to somebody and then that has hurt, how do you overcome? How can you think? If someone talks to us emotionally, like, and we wake up, it's not by and it's very intentional. Okay, all right. So one is if you are the person who who are emotionally telling someone on a, and it's hurt someone, what is the first thing we need to do? Repent. Ask forgiveness, right? If you've said something emotionally that you didn't mean to someone, you've later realized that you said it in an emotional way, the first thing for you to do is repent, ask for forgiveness. Okay? Sorry? Yeah, and you're admitting. That's what it means. You're, you repent and you ask for forgiveness and say, hey, you know, I'm really sorry for what I said. I, I, uh, I own my mistake. I own what I did say. I shouldn't have said that. Please forgive me. All right? That's you, if you're doing it. If someone else is doing it, okay, and you're hurt, you may first of all bear unforgiveness towards that person. So first and foremost is go to God. Clear that up with God and say, God, I need to clear this up because this is I, I feel anger towards the person. I feel hate towards the person. Set it right with God. Ask the Lord to give you the ability to forgive and reconcile, which means you can go back to the person and say, you know what you said, brother, what you said to me really upset me, it really hurt me. And I know that it is kind of bought a bridge in our, in our relationship. 
I want to set this right, and I want to I want to tell you that I was I was hurt, but you know I'm I'm also mentioning that you know I've forgiven that. However, I want to continue to reconcile. So that's that's the third that's the third part of that. Okay, all right, yeah. Someone got hurt from his uh, words, and after that he repented, and he asks forgiveness. And other person is not ready to forgive them. Then what we should do? If the other person is not ready to forgive them, you don't have a control over it. You can ask someone for forgiveness, but it is for them to release the forgiveness, right? You you've done your part, then just let it be. Allow God to handle it. Right? It's it's what you do from your part is asking for forgiveness and going ahead. If you want to, you can. You can. It really depends on the kind of the 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 uh, uh, the relationship, the extent of the relationship, right? If it's your own brother, and you definitely do want forgiveness, maybe you will try a couple of times. But after a point of time, you need to let it go. And let God handle it, because you've done what you can do. The rest is for God to work in their hearts to be able to release that forgiveness to you. Yeah. Means if the person is asking forgiveness and the other person is not trying to understand, and like we are emotionally attached with them or like family member, so what can we do in that situation? Similar. You have you've done your part of of forgiving or releasing forgiveness. They need to accept it, even when they are family members. They need to accept it, right? So it's uh, so even as they distance themselves from you, it's important to continue to ask the Lord for grace to deal with that situation, especially when they are family members that you are you're associated with on a regular basis. It is difficult. But asking the Lord to give you grace to keep communicating, keep being open till they are in a place of readiness. Sometimes, yeah, it takes people a lot to become ready, but that's what you're doing to give them, giving them the chance to be ready themselves. And ma'am, like uh, it happens, like uh, if uh, he is not accepting, like uh, he did something and I forgive him. And after many years, he is coming. Brings it up again. Uh, he is coming and telling, like I did wrong and all. And that time of moment, we are not ready to forgive him. So, what? Forgive him. It means how we can uh, make us like I. Like I will forgive him. Like see, forgiving is. I, I think we should remember that although it is a decision and a choice we make to forgive, it is something that the Holy Spirit helps us to do. Right, and especially in some some situations, it can be very hard to humanly forgive. And that's what needs the power of God. So if you find you're not able to humanly forgive. Uh, and follow that command, you go on your knees and ask the Lord to help you to do that. Right? And being able to renew your mind that, you know, when you forgive, there is a blessing. God has promised that there will be a blessing for those who forgive. Okay. All right. Let's close today. Thank you for all the questions. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you've taught us. Thank you, Lord, for um, putting into our hearts that our words have so much of power. Lord, uh, may we use our words to bless. May we use our words to create. Use our words to build, to encourage, to support. May we use our words, Lord, even in our own lives, to change and transform things, Father. May we use your word, God, in every situation of our lives, may, be it our family, be it our personal lives, be it the, uh, people who we influence, be it our city, our nation. May we use your word, Father, to bless. 
Thank you once again. Burn this truth, Lord, in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless. Thank you all.